Welcome uh, back to Sports Bazaar with me, Mick Malloy, and Titus O'Reilly. When we left you last, we were talking about Wimbledon and the crazy game. The crazy uh, game. No yeah. Vinnie Jones yet, but no. uh, things are shaping up. Where was it? We, we'd had a, a new manager. Owner. A new owner, and the team had certainly hit oh. their straps off the field. Off the field. On the field, they're not doing well. So yeah. the night we let, where we left, though, in 982 season, They'd gone up to Division 3, been relegated back down to Division 4, and they're yo-yoing back yeah. and forth between Division 4 and Division 3. They get, they're get they too good for Division 4, but they're not good enough to stay in Division 3, basically. And this is the kind of limbo, the kind of yep. purgatory yep. they have been in They've for been some time in. now. And so Bassett, the manager, is... Um, Who's doing great things with, with the team yes. in terms of uh, getting them motivated, uh, Covering everything. Yeah. Um, so he deci- he decides to bring in a new captain. Okay. The guy's name's Gary Peters. And what's what happened to Wally? Wally's not the captain. He's just the. Oh, he's never he's, the captain. No, he's just a chaos agent, <laughs> right? <laughs> so he's just total right. like nutcase. Um, he's sort of the spiritual leader. So there, Gary, there, there you go. That's yeah. what I had in mind. And so Gary Peters joins, and the existing players aren't thrilled, right? They're not like he's an outsider coming in yeah. straight to being captain. Um, and Gary's got a moustache. <laughs> so he Here arrives and all the players mock him about it straight yeah. away, right? <laughs> they just zero in on something. If you've got anything, it's like hey, zero you're in You're done. On you're cool. right? Um, so um, he comes in and they're about to go on a road trip and Bassett comes in, they're talking to her and he announces who's rooming with who on their way trip. And he announces that Gary Peters, the new captain, is going to be sharing his room with Wally Downs. <laughs> Bassett knows what he's doing. Um, this is Gary Peters says, Suddenly everyone started giggling and I had absolutely <laughs> no idea why. I found out the hard way. Around 1am the night before our first game, I was woken from my sleep to find him sitting on my chest trying to silently shave off my moustache. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a beauty. Um, um, it, apparently, the players were refusing to have a moustached captain in their mm. team. Um, but he said, but I got on with everyone straight away. I like to drink and a laugh. So for the uh, part of this, uh, se- before the next season, uh, the players also went to France. Mm. And they had a whole week in a little village that was on an estuary. And there was a bar... And every night it had the same two old people in there and it was just boring. So you yeah. got this whole footy team that, and yeah. these are all likely lads. They want, yeah. a, they want some women, some booze, some fun, a party, Project. right? And instead they're in this quiet little, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. bar. Oh. So they can see on the other side of the river there's another bar that's got these flashing lights. I'm begging for it. And they're going, we've got to get to that bar. But the... the um, to get there, you've, there's a 12 miles away is the nearest bridge and they don't have the money for a taxi or any way of getting across yeah. that, right? It's too far. So <laughs> they're thinking about, oh, what can we do? And they decided one night, well, why don't, there's a rowboat there. <laughs> why don't we borrow this rowboat, row across and go to that bar? What could go wrong? Yeah. Now they find out as they're starting out that the rowboat's only got one paddle. <laughs> it's missing one. Okay. But they managed to get over the river okay. There's no problem. And they tied the boat to the post, right? And the other bar they find out is exactly the same. It's empty, <laughs> pointless, but with flashing lights. So they've got all this trouble. And yeah. it's, So they stay and drink for ages anyway. Because what? Like why go back to the other one? They're so there now. They've done it, yeah. They come back out. They're all off their heads. Mm. And the rowboat is hanging in midair because the tide's gone out. And it's an estuary. <laughs> so the water's gone, basically, yeah. and the boat's just hanging. Can, can they get across? Well, they, it's still got enough water in it. They've got to, So they try and untie the boat, which yeah. they do, and they manage to get it down into the water, well but it's much lower. So then they all get in the boat, uh, and then, but they don't realise, you know, the tide's gone, it's still going out. So they start getting sucked out to sea in the boat. <laughs> Um, and luckily Bassett sees them and he runs up and on the bank they manage to throw him a rope and he 
drags them out. The boat capsizes in the process, and they're halfway <laughs> and down. The, well, no, it's halfway down the river, so they've managed to get out. But then they've got to carry the boat all the way back to the hostel. <laughs> they're all completely the weird. Um, Peters said Bassett's management style was unlike any managers he'd ever played for. Right? He said it was strict but with a twist. He said, one day the players started throwing things around on the train home from a game. On Monday, Harry uh, the Bassett, the manager, and Sam, the owner, mm. call Peters in as captain and they start lecturing him about the mess caused on the train. And he said, and I pointed out that they had started it. <laughs> <laughs> They're lecturing him even though they... (laughs) Uh, So the 1982-83 has started and they're in Division 3 where they keep getting knocked down and it starts terribly and they're not doing well. And Bassett realised that what he's doing on the field is just not working. Yes. Right? The team's had this great morale but it's just not working, whatever's happening. And one of the problems he realises is we're a small club you know, we've got this tiny, decrepit stadium. We can't generate revenue through tickets. Yes. So we just are not able to h- hire the really skillful players you need to play a certain type of football, which is when you pass a lot, hold the ball a lot, yeah. um, keep possession, sure. pass it around until there's an opening and all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. So sort of like, you know, Barcelona at their peak and all Correct. that. He realised we can't play like that. We're just not skillful enough to get a result that way. And we're getting beaten all the time. And he also noticed through chatting to the stats guy and the video review guy, they start examining everything. And this is where they're doing money ball before money yeah. ball, right? They realise that they look very carefully at how a goal scored. And they find that even by the very top teams, the majority of them come from set pieces, free kicks and corners, mm-hmm or crosses in play into the box. And so he says to his team, we are going to change the entire way we play. We're going to play direct. So we're basically going to get the ball in defence, or if the goalkeeper's got it, we're just going to hoof it right up to our end of the field, right? And we're we're going to do it in no more than three passes. None of this trying to sit on the ball, hold the ball, move it around skillfully. We're just not up to that way of playing. Um, he said to them all, according to all the stats we've looked at, even if the initial attack doesn't deliver a goal, the resulting corners, throw-ins and free kicks create this sustained pressure and they almost always result in goals eventually if you do it mm. this way. So he got them all out on the pitch and he'd organise these shadow training sessions. He wouldn't have a ball and he'd just manoeuvre the players around the park saying, this is where you've got to be, this is where you've got to be, this is how we're going to do it. Um he also got them to watch all the film so that they kind of could see what he was talking about. And he sent a f- quite a few of them off regularly to go do their coaching degrees just so they understood football better. Yes. So while they're absolute maniacs in one way, yep. they're actually incredibly savvy tactically yep. and everything in okay. another way, right? Um, he knew they had to be fit to do it, but he was like, you know what? It's... It's totally worth it to get, you know, they're already fit. I've had them yeah. running and everything, right? They all don't want to play it. They all are like, this isn't what we signed up for. This is kind of boring and mm. it's it's too simple, right? But he says, no, we're going to do it. And he also says we're going to be way more physical. So that season they got ticked off by the Football Association for a reckless number of bookings. <laughs> yes. But And the other teams hated it because suddenly they're getting this really fast. Like the minute the ball's in the defence, it just gets hoofed up the other end. You've yes. got to run up after even if you're the defence. Yep. And they're getting this really physical, tackling, hard game, okay. right? And it starts to work. All the players start realising we're winning and they all become 100% committed to this style of play. And this becomes a nightmare for opponents, right? They mm. just hate playing them, right? They go on an unbeaten run in 22 games. So they might not have won them all. They tied some. Yeah. But they um, go on at the end. Now, Tony Stenson, who's a sports writer for the Daily Mirror, he noticed this, how well they're going. And he wrote a piece, and the opening line was, Meet David Dave Bassett's team of all sorts, rag-ass rovers, soccer's crazy gang. <laughs> and so suddenly they've got their name. They go on with this to win... Um, 
the whole thing with 98 points, the most of any league at the time. Third division. So they're suddenly going incredibly well and they get back up to Division 3. Um, now, because they'd won the league, every player gets a £10 raise, right? right? But Mickey Smith and Alan Cork didn't because they'd been injured during the season. So Peters' as captain goes to Bassett and says, come on, give them yeah. the increase. And Bassett says... I'll only give them the rise if they work one night a week in the Sportsman, which is the pub that the club owns, right? This is how poor and yeah, cheap yeah. they are, right? Peters goes to Cork and says he wants you to work in the bar one night a week. And he says, fuck off. <laughs> Peters doesn't even bother to ask Mickey Smith because he's like, oh, oh, you know. So he goes back to Bassett and says, all sorted, give them their raise. Uh-huh. And he goes, they agree? He goes, yep, they've all agreed. So Peters ends up doing their two nights a week working behind the bar. Oh, good call. Because he's the captain and he's Fantastic. like... this is like, Now, he found out he liked it so much, working behind the bar, that he actually bought, buys a pub in Berkshire and it changed his life completely because the pub does really, really well. Yes. So well, in fact, he then buys another pub <laughs> and this sets him up for life after football as... A really well what a off. good story mm, yeah all because, where that came from all because yeah. they agreed so so in 83 84 they're in division three and they'd always struggled this was always their problem you could get up yeah. to division three but so the new style though holds up suddenly like this is but the secret right mm. they've found the way to play for what talent they've, they've got. got they don't have liverpool or yeah. you know, any of those clubs True. you know finesse but they've got yeah. this committed very easy to understand, very yeah. pertinent way of playing. So they're in Division 3, it holds up and they finish runners-up and are promoted to the second division. And this shocks Jeez. the football world. It's like you've only been in the football leagues a few years yeah. and now you're in the second highest division in the entire league. Everyone says they're going to crash and burn mm. in Division 2, right? This style... Out of their depth. Yeah. yeah, this style, they don't have any stars, it's not going to work. They go up into the second division and they have this culture that they've developed because of all this where they just don't fear anyone, Mm. right? If anything, they're intimidating everyone. That's their style, (laughs) right? And so they're totally committed and they finish 12th, which is an astounding result. They stay up there and everyone's like, oh my God. So in the 85-86 season, before it starts and the fact they're in Division 2 again, Ron Nodes has gone over to Crystal Palace, the original owner, he convinces Bassett to join him as manager. And this is no. a huge blow to Wimbledon because this guy is the genius coach that's oh. got them up. Um, Bassett turns up to work at Palace and realises he's made a huge mistake and hates it. And after four days, quits and goes back to Wimbledon. <laughs> God for that. That was madness. Yeah. What was he thinking? Hammond, the owner, is not thrilled though. Mm. So there's a bit of a riff, but they sort of patch it over. So the next year they start in Division 2. They beat Middlesbrough 3-0 on the opening day. And they're looking like they could actually get promoted. So they're doing so well in Division 2, they could yeah. get promoted. Which would mean they would be promoted to Division 1 which is the highest division at this yeah. point. It's what l- is later becomes the, the Premier, Premier League. League yeah. Which is just, for a team of no-hopers, off-casts, all these people can't believe it. So in 1986, they have nine games left and Bassett thinks we need something else to just get it over the line. Yeah. We need a striker. Um, and so they sign Millwall's John Fashionow. Now, he's a record signing for them. He's 125 thousand pounds which is huge for them and he's are they still on the same ground still the same ground they're still dirt poor this was a huge outlay he settles in and kicks four goals in the final four games it's an amazing thing but he's an odd guy he's born in kensington london he's the son of a nurse who's from uh, british guyana and his dad's a nigerian barrister so he's sort of an out of sorts guy he's a black player and this is when often black players were still yeah enormous amounts of racism stuff of course his parents had split up when he was young and him and his brother um when they were five and they when they split up they didn't share custody they sent them to a foster home and they were eventually adopted by family alf and betty jackson um, and brought up in yeah 
So this means he's always got this kind of odd personality yes. about fitting in, yeah. you know, which is understandable. Yeah, I, absolutely. His mum, his foster mum says his childhood, he was so insecure, she used to have to cuddle him to, uh, tight just to calm him down. So he's a, a, a you know, strange guy. He wanted to be white, uh, he used to say to her, and she said, you've just got to be better than anyone else at what you do because you're black. Yeah. So he has his real insecurities, abandonment at five. Mm-hmm. His foster family are very loving. But yes. he's got a few things. So yeah. he often would talk in the third person. <laughs> so he once said, Fash, they used to call him. Fash was a physical bastard and you would either have to adapt or dissolve as a person. Yeah. So he would say things like that. When he arrived at the club, Bassett said, he, he said to Bassett, I am not in the crazy gang. Do not cut up my clothes and I won't cut up yours. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I want no part in it. Yeah. Right? So he's sort of on his own from the beginning in a way. Wally said, that didn't stop me from filling his tea with salt and nicking his favourite silk socks. We had a confrontation, but it was nothing serious. He starts to fit in a bit because he's doing well on things and he's never fully in it in a way, but in other ways he finds that the family's never had. Yeah, so So he's he's tolerating it it. and he's finding... Yeah, Yeah, he turns up though for um, the morning of his debut at Portsmouth and it's on Easter Saturday, and he's in jeans and a casual shirt and dressed up a lot nicer than everyone else. So the players vote to fine him £30. <laughs> he had that coming. He had a black belt. He fancies himself as a bit of a tough guy. Liverpool's John Barnes once said that he would stand at the centre circle before games, executing kickboxing moves right before kickoffs. <laughs> but he could also be quite angry. So Laurie Sanchez, who was one of the players who uh, he played with, he, they once got in a fight and Sanchez told a reporter that he tried to karate kick his legs and break his legs. And Terry Gibson said the two of them didn't speak for six years after that. They yeah. never spoke. They were in the same changing room but they wouldn't even celebrate together. Mm. So there was a bit of tension um, when he sort of joined. So it didn't help that um, the owner, Hammond, offered him £2,000 per goal he scored. And so Fash would fight for every penalty and would even push teammates out of the way if there was to an easy tap-in. If there was an easy tap-in in the oh, middle of the game. No. So he sort of been... The, in That doesn't put him in sync with everyone else, No, does he? He's t- playing for himself. In 2007, the Times named him 22nd out of the 50 worst footballers to ever played in the Premier League. And this is on his personality, right? right. So despite all this on the field, he's perfect. He's brutal on the pitch. He's a great scorer. And... He has set them up by joining, by scoring these four goals as a chance for them to go up to the top yeah. league, Division One. They needed to win at Huddlesfield Town in the final game to lock in third spot. That would get them into yeah. the top division. It was pouring rain. A journalist who saw this game described it as a match littered with fouls ranging from petty to downright spiteful, <laughs> if reflecting little credit on either side. <laughs> <laughs> There's a brawl at one stage and Huddersfield have two men sent off. Um, one of them had taken down Fashion out. Fash gets booked not long after, but Wimbledon score and they hold on. So just nine years after making the Football League, they score and they hold on. Wimbledon hold on and they win. And, and so they're up. just nine years after making it into the Football League and four years after playing in Division 4, they're in Division 1. Incredible. It's an astounding thing. It's all done with this style of direct, tough football. Many people hate them, though. They saw the footballer players ugly. They saw the players as thugs. They saw them as a small, poor club. Yeah. Now, there is a fair bit of evidence that they were quite rough, but then there's also a fair bit of evidence that the 80s football in Britain, everyone had enforcers. It sure. was pretty tough. A lot, a lot of it is they were poor, so yeah. people didn't like... They thought they were a, just... A bit uppity. Uppity. Uppity poor folk. And there was a jealousy factor because they'd done what every club would dream to yeah. have done and they'd done it. There was also things where their fans would sing because they because they were in Wimbledon. They were, by this point, the Wombles, the show was around and they lived in on, in Wimbledon <laughs> Common. Yeah. So the fans would sing, we are, the, we are Wombles, we are Wombles, we are Wombles from the lane. We drink champagne, we snort cocaine, we are the Wombles <laughs> from the lane. <laughs> Beautiful. Um... <laughs> Now, some of the truth of them being rough, though, was true. Hodges, who's the defender we've mentioned before, mm. 
He said, one year I broke the record for the most disciplinary points ever uh, totted up, 52. I had to go to the FA quite a few times. At one stage, I wanted to send a representative to check out my background and meet my parents. I was getting in so much... They're doing background checks. I was getting in so much trouble that they thought I was from a seriously troubled background or some sort of nutcase. They wanted to unearth what the problem was with me. It was always dissent. I once got booked for visual dissent. Work that one out. I didn't say I'd do anything physically and got done for visual dissent. <laughs> so just staring at someone. That's great. Um, he said Bassett fired me, fined me for it anyway. <laughs> um, he would have got a bit of visual dissent. Yeah, a lot. After he... The amazing thing is, though, people, because of this reputation as being lads and violent and all this sort of stuff and tough and all this sort of stuff, the club and Bassett used to love to play up to that mm. because he said it made them not realise what we were really doing. So, yeah, we were all those things, but we were actually very yeah. tactically astute. Gotcha. We knew what we were doing. We were doing stuff like video editing and stats. I was preparing mm. dossiers on opponents. Yes. We were bringing back, we were film, getting games from overseas in Europe and, and learning from that. We were doing all this stuff. So we were quite happy for them to th- think we were idiots, yeah. right? Um, so a lot of the media kind of played up with it too. Um, and for example, when they arrived in the first division, 13 players in that squad had come through the youth system. Mm. So they're turning everyone into yeah. a great player, right? Um, the When they got promoted to division one, the first division, mm. Margaret Thatcher, the then PM, said, if we can sell Newcastle Brown to Japan and if Wimbledon can make it to the first division, there is surely no achievement beyond our reach. So there that's how go. big a news it is uh, you got there. Fantastic. So there's a lot of people who love this rags to riches story too of Wimbledon, but there's the ones that hate them. Terry Venable said, Wimbledon are killing the dreams that made football the world's greatest game. Because they just didn't pass it around and yeah, do the, all step overs. It's uh, within the rules. Yeah. Um, Brian Talbot, another player, told the press they will get killed with their style of football, meaning in the first division. So well, people we've heard are this before. predicting they're going to go. Football Association Secretary Ted Croker, who was the head of the Football Association, he said Wimbledon's facilities were totally incapable of staging first division football and that it was ridiculous clubs such as Manchester United and Tottenham were having to go there. He thought they shouldn't even be in the first division. So they, so everyone's kind of against it. It's Bat- not a warm welcome to the no. Premier League, is it? Yeah. Bassett loves it because yeah, he it's a siege mentality. Mm. So he actually goes on to... This is when Alex Ferguson is kind of just about to be appointed man yep. United and they play each other a lot. And, he, and Alex Ferguson's one of the few managers who never criticises Wimbledon. He gets it. And Ferguson loves the siege mentality. Yeah. He becomes the king of it. And I'm not saying he learned it from Bassett, but he yeah. definitely saw that there was this yeah. tight management of how you do it. And he used to have a drink with Bassett after games yeah. and stuff. So, you know, uh, smart people were getting it. Um, on the first game in the Premier League, they lost to Manchester City. And after the game, one of the team's kit bags was stolen from the car park by someone described as a skinny moss side adolescent. <laughs> Man, the David Bassett does a press conference and yes. someone says, we understand your kit bag, one of them got um, um, pinched. And he said, it's still much better than playing at Rochdale. <laughs> <laughs> so they just don't care. Right? Yeah. They, um, they then reel off consecutive wins against Aston Villa, Leicester, Watford and Charlton and they end up top of the table <laughs> halfway through the season. Fantastic. Right? All the experts had written them off. Charlton boss says, Charlton's boss, uh, Le- uh, Lenny Lawrence, says after they lost to um, Wimbledon, he said, all the experts wrote them off, but I can tell you it takes some effort and commitment to match them. Eamon Dunphy for the Sunday Times wrote... There are those who claim that the Wimbledon play isn't really football. Ted Croker, the secretary of the Football Association, no less, is one of them. He's even said that Wimbledon should not be in the first division at all. But what Croker and others in English football should be doing is extending to Dave Bassett and his Wimbledon players the respect and admiration they deserve. Yeah, very cool. So when they are on top of the table, this is in the mid-season, Bassett said, my mum will want the season to finish tomorrow. And he says, I'm not saying this is two fingers up to Ted Croker. 
<laughs> but we have already answered him. But we should. Uh, but we have shown that football does need clubs like us. So they've Great. come in. People can't believe they're there, and now they're top of the table, right? Mm. Part of the benefit they realise Wimbledon is the fact that Plough Lane is so horrible. Mm. So like the um, Croker, the boss is not totally wrong. All wrong mm. that it's a terrible ground and probably shouldn't be playing it. Um, the the stands very high and very close in, so it's claustrophobic right. to play there. And they realise if we just play up to this being horrible, it makes it a really horrible trip for teams to come here. Because yes. these are players that are starting to get nice facilities, yeah. a bit of money. Let's make it a nightmare to come well, to our home. Absolutely. So the like way the, Bronx. the away's dressing room was all, was often unpleasantly cold. It was rarely ever cleaned, <laughs> and it frequently was covered with toilet paper. Often Wimbledon, before the team arrived, would cover the floor with water. <laughs> a few, few bins yep. out the door. Other times they would make sure the heating in the dressing room was turned up way too high <laughs> and the toilets wouldn't flush. Right. right, so they're just playing mind games. Um, they would put salt in the opposition's sugar bowl at the tea station. <laughs> It's very well thought through. Yeah, it's just total. Um, they wouldn't also. They'd also play mind games on the road, right? So they mm. didn't just do it at home. Um, when they played away, they would bring the, a huge stereo mm. um, into the dressing room, and they would blare garage music at full blast. So it would just be horrible. They'd leave the door open and yes. just make it horrible, right? At one game, Everton knew about this, so they turned off the power to their dressing room. <laughs> But the the Wimbledon players had already thought of that and bought batteries. <laughs> <laughs> so you, like you kind of couldn't out prank them because they would think uh, this, yeah, they're the best. Yeah, they would think this through. Right. Right. Class. Um, now, just because they're now top of the the number one team, this is halfway through the season of um, in the Division One in the land. Really, they continued with what I described as their unique culture, right? Mm. Um, so the room the players used for meals at the stadium. Um, it was converted into a player bar afterwards and then it would be turned into a nightclub in the evening. Yes. So Terry Phelan, who played for them, said you'd probably stay in the players' lounge bar all day after the game and then it would turn into a nightclub at 9pm. Night so you'd never leave the ground if you wanted to have a few drinks. Um, the game would finish at 4.45. You'd go to the bar, drink, then you'd get ch- it'd change in a nightclub and you'd think we might as well stay here now until 2 or 3 in the morning. Phelan said it was tough... Um, at first when he joined the team. He once went to the manager and said, oh, I really can't handle it, boss, because they were all giving it to him. And uh, Bassett knew Terry's strength as the new guy, but he knew his strength was running. Yes. So he went and told his uh, assistant coach, he said, the next morning, only at training, just do constant running. Yeah. And so Terry wins every single race and all the guys suddenly go, oh, this guy's good. Yeah. So right. he was a master at yeah. just... Um, now, another time a player, John Scales, came in and he had a new pair of Gucci loafers. Oh, right? They're doomed. Everyone notices. Get out the DP. Everyone notices them, right? Of course they do. He gets changed into his training gear, goes out to training, and the players get two six-inch nails and a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> they take the insoles out, nail the boots to the bench, and put the insoles back in. And they just <laughs> left the boots there on the bench underneath his clothes, right? After training, he comes in, has a shower. He goes to pick up his shoes and they don't move. The players are all laughing. He looks at the bench, sees the nails. So he just leaves them there, goes out in his thongs. (laughs) Another time, the owner, Sam uh, Hammonen, was on the team coach to Aston Villa playing cards with Dennis Wise and Alan Cork and a few others. And they weren't playing for money. They said to the owner, the player said to the Sam, the owner, if you lose, we cut something off your clothes. <laughs> Sam goes to Aston Villa and his tie was cut. He had no collar on his shirt, no arms on his shirt or jacket. His trousers were cut to his knees and his socks were cut. He had to wear a track suit to get into the chairman's <laughs> lounge. <laughs> oh, um, fantastic. Another time Eric Young joined from Brighton and Hove Albion and he used to come in with the blue bag with the Brighton Seagulls still on it and it was like his lucky bag. Right. And the players weren't having it. They're like, you're with us now. You're not with Brighton. 
So one day Eric's getting treatment from the physio. So they douse the bag with lighter fuel and put a match to it. It fills the entire room and the cafe next door with so much smoke that the whole place has to be evacuated. The players then danced around the fire until the fire brigade turns up. (laughs) This is gold. (laughs) Despite all this, they still keep doing really well. They don't stay top. But they finish six and they reach the FA Cup quarterfinals, Jeez. which in their first Very ever good. season, people suddenly go, yeah. These guys are here to stay. Everyone was hoping they'll be back in Division yes. Two next year. No. Suddenly they're not. So around this time, they've just, uh, you know, they're finishing off that season. Around this time, French, the physio, he is friends with a guy's family and notices this young guy playing. And the name of the guy is Vinnie Jones. Mm. And he's playing amateur football and he's working as a builder, a building site as a labourer. So he's not even a yeah. builder, right? He's just the guy that carries bricks around yes. and does all the, uh, like the terrible jobs. And so he says, he thinks this guy's all right. He says, come to training. So he comes to training and Bassett's not impressed at all. Bassett says, Bjork, we can't really use you at the moment. You're not quite up to it. But he sends him away to Sweden's third tier to play. And there he wins player of the year. And Bassett liked these tests because in his mind it was like, if you can go and play in another country, be away from your family, all that, and stick it out, you might have the mental toughness to come and join Israel. So um, he comes back and Bassett says, look, we'll sign you. And so he goes to Sam, the owner, and says, I want to buy Vinnie Jones from the non-league side, Wheelstone, for Ten thousand pounds, and Sam goes, "You're mad." Who I don't even know who this guy is. Yeah. We're in the Premier League. What are you doing? Why are you hiring someone who's from an, a semi-professional yes. team? Like you know, mm. should be buying them from like lip, like Division yeah, Two yeah, at minimum, yeah. right? Sure. At least you know. And uh, Bassett says, "Don't worry, I'm going to pay him 120 pounds a week, and if that didn't work out, you can always just get him to cut the grass or paint stands or something, right? Whatever." And so he says, okay, fine. And so Vinny comes around to Bassett's house and Bassett says to him, right, you're going to be on £150 a week plus £50 a goal and £50 per appearance in the first team. Mm. And there's no guarantee you'll be in the first yes. team. And he says, um, that's it, see you tomorrow. And Jones is standing there and doesn't move. And uh, Bassett says, what's up? And Vinny Jones says, any chance of a signing on fee? And Bassett says, no, now fuck off. I've given you your chance. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome aboard. Bassett's wife, Christine, says, he's nice, handsome, when he leaves, he's nice, handsome, but not the brightest spark. (laughs) And Bassett replied, don't worry, he's a footballer. They're all like that. (laughs) So Jones isn't the creator of the crazy gang, which a lot of people think. Like often later documentaries have portrayed him as sort of the... Key yeah. guy of yeah, it all, sure. right? The builder. It's, it's you know, it's seven years in when mm. he joins, mm. right? Like, as I said at the start of the first episode, he yes. is the product of this, right? So early in training, he's doing one of his earliest trainings. He hasn't played in the first team, mm. right? And he's like 21 years old and everyone's like, who's this guy? Yeah. And one day, uh, Wally Downs is injured a lot so he's sort of become the assistant coach even though he's technically still playing and Wally Downs turns up and he's watching training and he goes you 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 pick six players and Vinny thinks oh he's seen something in me this is fantastic right Mm. and and Wally Downs is like the spiritual leader the everyone looks up to him right and so Vinny's thrilled he thinks this we're going to do a special drill at training with him this is great um, it turns out Downs was recruiting them to build his patio at his house that Sunday. <laughs> All business. Okay. He's, yes. Yes. So he says, you guys, be at my house on Sunday. I need a patio built. <laughs> oh, jeez. So Vinny turns up and they build the patio all day on, on, the, on the Sunday. And they've pretty much finished and they've poured the concrete, done a bunch of the stuff. And Downs, Wally notices that his tortoise, which is named Lightning, is missing. And he goes, where the hell's my tortoise? (laughs) Lightning. That's such a funny (laughs) name. (laughs) 
And Vinnie Jones says, I think I saw it over there near the cement. And they rush over to the cement and the tortoise is half in the cement. Right. And they have to pull it out and whisk him and the tortoise is fine. Was this a prank? No. It just no, the the total tortoise has, has yeah. slipped into the concrete that's rapidly hardening. So the tortoise is fine, but Wally then decides he likes Vince. <laughs> he likes <laughs> Vinnie Jones, right? So Vinny makes his debut against Nottingham Forest, mm. right? He was so bad, people said it was one of the most embarrassing debuts in the history of football. Yeah. At halftime, Vinny says to Sid, the kit man, who looks after all their kit, he said, how, how do you think I'm going? And Sid says, if that's the best you can do, why don't you keep your shirt? Because if it was left to me, you'd never get another one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just at half time. At half time. And this is the kit guy. Yeah, so even yeah, the kit yeah. guy is like... There's just some feedback there's for you. There's no, like, it's just harsh yes. feedback, right? Like, um, in the second half, Vinny has a moment where he loses his mind. He punches an opposition cross away, which, of course, gives up a penalty because you can't handball, <laughs> which is converted. And everyone is like, what are you doing? What mate? are you doing? What Why? was that? Yeah. They, he, thinks, he punches a cross away. I've <laughs> never seen that. A and everyone, deliberate... Yeah, and everyone's like... So everyone's just like, well, that kid's gone. He's, yeah. he's terrible. Surprisingly, the next game's against Man United. And everyone's as surprised, especially Vinny, that he's picked He's again. still playing. Right. But early on, he scores. He plays a lot better. And everyone's like, oh. Anyway, later on that game, they're up 1-0. And Remy Moses, who plays for Manchester United at the time, subbed off. And Vinny uh, says to him as he goes off, you ain't had a kick anyway, right? Yeah. And then he looks over to Wally and winks and says, that's the hard work done now anyway. Yeah. And then they then realise the man being subbed on is Brian Robson, who's the best yes. midfield player in the world at the time and the <laughs> captain of England. And Wally points out Robson coming on. This is straight after he's just said that's the hard yeah. work out of the way. And they both look at each other and Jones gives a panic look. And then Wally and Vinnie Jones just burst out laughing at this like absurdity the of the whole nature, thing. Yeah. And Robson looks at them both and says, what the fuck are you two laughing at? <laughs> and they just keep laughing. And this kind of unnerves him. Yeah. And this adds to the mistake that of these the guys team. are just bonkers. They're right? nuts. Like, they're just absolutely nuts. So they end up winning 1-0. Vinnie's goal is the winner. Um, so Vinnie and Wally become great mates. Yep. Which is not surprising, mm. right? Um, one time they're driving to a game, this time they're all driving, they hit traffic and Wally jumps out uh, and in front of them is two teammate, uh, two teammates in a car and they've got the windows open mm. and this is before air yeah. and everything. And he jumps out of the car when they hit traffic, runs up to their car with a um, big amount of talcum powder and throws it in <laughs> through the window and it <laughs> fills the whole car and they can't see. <laughs> That was bound to happen. And it's on like the inside of the windscreen yeah, yeah, and everything. Yeah. It's an absolute oh, it's nut. And he runs back, gets in the car, and then the traffic starts moving. <laughs> um, of course, they hit more traffic and the teammates return the favour. Oh, I bet right? they do. And so he said that um, for the whole drive, which went for about an hour, there was a talcum powder, powder war on the entire drive, right? They're just covering each yeah. other's cars with talcum powder. One of the most famous moments for Vinny is once he was told he'd have to play um, on, and they were playing Newcastle United, mm. and Bassett comes to him and says, "You're playing on Paul Gascoigne, Gazza." Yes, Gazza. Now Gazza's already been marked as the future of English football, even at twenty, mm. right? And um, Vinny arrives, and he doesn't think anything of it, and he mm. goes to the game. Everything's fine. He's laughing with the guys and stuff. And it's all going out on the pitch. He's still, Vinny's still in the dressing room, but he can hear Gaz has gone out there to warm up and there's a frenzy because this guy's been yes. anointed the next big thing. And um, they all go out there and they guys come back and say to Vinny, there's girls running around with bouquets of flowers and roses and chocolates. It's like Beatlemania out there, right? <laughs> and Vinny says something snapped in him. <laughs> and he thought... I could be the laughing stock of this game. What if he scores four goals? What if he runs right, yeah. right? Like this guy is a phenomenal player, right? And so he doesn't go out for warm-up, mm. right? 
and he stretches in the dressing room and he's building himself up mentally and he says he then goes out on the pitch, sees Gazza and he thinks, I'm going to kill him. <laughs> so Jones goes out and says to Gazza, I'm not playing, playing football today and neither are you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Gazza says later he remembers Vinny stuck with him the whole game and would warn him not to move when Jones went to take a throw in or corner. He'd say to Gazza, don't you move. Gazza was so terrified, he'd say, that's fine, Vinny, I ain't going anywhere, right? <laughs> Eventually, though, Gazza gets a bit of his courage up, yeah. right? And the minute he does, Vinny fouls him, <laughs> Yeah. right? And they're fighting and they stand up and they're waiting for the ball to be kicked again after, uh, at another set play and they're fighting and they start jostling each other. And Gazza says, how much are they paying you for this? Are you getting £100 for this today? And Vinny just snaps. Gazza's standing behind him. They're both facing forward. Mm. And Vinny just reaches back. And this becomes one of the most famous photos mm -hmm. in footballing history and just squeezes Gazza's testicles. <laughs> <laughs> Vinny later said he had a bit of luncheon on him, the boy, to be fair to him. It was straight on the button. I just grabbed it and didn't let it go. <laughs> Right, the photo's amazing. Vinny's face yeah. is in full anger, like, and Gaz is wincing. Um, beyond that, though, the two go on to become incredibly good friends. There you go. You know, because they're you know, very similar. Another time, Alan Shearer is on the field before the game and he's taking the piss out of Wimbledon. He's going on about how poor they are and how crap <laughs> they are and he's getting stuck into them. And he didn't realise Vinnie Jones was standing right behind him. So Vinny grabbed him by both his ears and then just moves him out of the way. <laughs> Um, the the Vinny Jones gets so into the prank that one yeah. time a man uh, rings Bassett, the manager, and mm. says, "I'm the athletic Bill Bale chairman," which would be the athletic, oh, yeah, Bill, okay, yeah, yeah, big big team at the time, and said, um, "Peter Robson from Liverpool has recommended you. Would you meet with me to discuss becoming our manager?" And Bassett thinks it's Vinny playing a joke because the <laughs> it's a type Spanish of thing he would do. Yeah, and the Spanish accent it's so is terrible. So, so terrible, right? <laughs> but he likes a prank, so he says, Yeah, I'll meet you at the hotel. No worries. Thinking <laughs> so he turns up this fancy hotel. He turns up in a t shirt, shorts and flip flops or thongs, right? And he hasn't shaved. He looks like crap. And he's sitting at the bar and he's just waiting for the players to burst out and go, Oh, I got you and all this. And instead, this very well-dressed, very proper Spanish bloke walks up and introduces himself, and it's all true. Anyway, he doesn't get the job. You idiot. Just because of that. Yeah. Now, perhaps to finish this ep, uh, to give you an idea of Vinny, mm. Vinny later on goes and uh, um, plays for Leeds. And so this is after he's left Wimbledon, but give you, just to give us a sense of the guy. One day before the game, they all run out, and the five for Leeds, the five they have a five-year-old mascot of the day. So you know yes. they haven't got a kid to run sure. out on the team. So this is a five-year-old who's the mascot. He's decked out in a full Leeds yep. kit. Finney's playing for Leeds, and um, the they're all muck, like warming up, and apparently this kid's mucking around and and waving to the crowd and getting them on. He's He's taking shots against the uh, Mervyn Day, who's the goalkeeper, and he's showing him up a bit, right? Because <laughs> he's fully drilling them and yeah. stuff. And the goalkeeper's not really trying. Yeah. But Vinny was looking at this going, this kid's getting ahead of himself. He needs to be, <laughs> he needs to be taken out. Yeah. <laughs> right? Um, Vinny says he had to have it. He had to go. He was giving it all that on the way out, he was. Started getting the crowd going. Mervyn Day was in goal. He smashed run past Mervyn in the top goal corner. So I thought... He's got to go. <laughs> um, when you go out with the mascots and you're holding hands, when, he, when we, he was like saying, I thought, has anyone ever taken one out? That would be funny. Yeah. Um, so it was really wet and slidey. And Vinny goes up to David Batty, who plays for Leeds, his teammate, yes. and says, watch this. <laughs> and Batty screams, no, no. <laughs> And Vinny goes sliding in, slides a long way and takes the kid's legs out just as he's about to smack one at the keeper. <laughs> there's not footage of this, but there's a brilliant oh, series of man. photos. There's a, I'll, I'll put them on the Discord for the members. The photo is, he. it doesn't look like he's holding back that much, right? <laughs> he's got the full treatment. He just takes this kid out and the kid's going flying, right? Uh, the kid's name was Rob Kelly. And uh, Vinny was told after the game he's five years old and Jones replies in that post-match prep conference, 
Five? I thought he was at least six. <laughs> years later, years later, the kid, Rob Kelly, is all grown up mm. and he meets Jones on a TV show. They set it up, oh, right? Yeah. And Jones shakes his hands and just laughing and he says, I'm not apologising, you should have sent, stood up. You went down a bit easy. <laughs> so funny. To finish off there, yes. we're now at the point where most of the team, there's a few, few sightings to come, but we're really getting into the point where Wimbledon are going to do something very special. All right. And it's going to really cap off this era as one of complete madness, but prove that they are one of the great sports stories of all time. I can't tell you how much I'm enjoying this. This is a great ride. Uh, and uh, I can't thank you enough for bringing it to the table. Titus O'Reilly.